session in the SDL Reconnect series. Today's session is entitled Staying Connected with Customers, Solutions for the Finance and Legal Sectors. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. You should see your control panel on the bottom of your screen. You can set your console how you like or leave it as it is with the default settings. One area to point out is the Q&A button. We invite you to ask your questions so we can pose them to the group today. We're really excited to hear from you, so please do give us your feedback, and we'll look forward to getting to those at the end of the session today. You'll see also that there's a survey on that control panel too. We have some great content for you today, and we know you're going to find it really useful. For that reason, we'll be sending you a link to the recording after this series so you can listen again or share with your colleagues. So first, some introductions. I'm David Hetling, and I'll be leading today's panel session. I'm responsible for SDL's marketing to customers in regulated industries globally, and I'm based in London. For information, SDL works with 19 of the top 20 worldwide financial services institutions, as well as 19 of the top 20 global law firms, many of whom are represented in the audience today. Welcome to you all. I'm joined today by a panel of colleagues who collectively have huge experience in the language industry, including many years working with finance and legal firms. Let me start with you, Christoph. Thank you, David. Hello and bonjour, everyone. Firstly, I would like to thank you all for attending the webinar today. We are very excited, and it's a pleasure to have you all with us today. So my name is Christophe Giovanni. I'm based in Paris. I'm French, as you can probably tell from my accent. Um, I joined SDL in 2018 following the acquisition of Donnelly Language Solutions. I am now responsible for the regulated industry team within SDL. So I started in New York 20 years ago as a project manager, handling mainly IPOs, M&As, and asset management documentation. After five years, I transferred to London to set up the global operation. In 2005, I moved then to Paris to set up the global sales team before joining the executive team. Again, warm welcome, and thank you very much for attending the webinar today. Welcome, Christophe. Thank you very much. Let me move next to Christy. Great. Thank you, David. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Christy Ma. I'm based in Hong Kong, and I lead a team in ATEC to support our clients in the regulated industry. Um, I've been in the industry for about 16 years now, and similar to Christoph, I also started in New York, where I was a project manager and mainly handling the IPO coming out of Asia. And then I moved to Hong Kong in 2008, took on a, a more client-facing role. And my main responsibility now is to understand our clients' local requirements and take them internally to see what type of resources, workflow, technology that we need to put together in place to address uh, our clients' multilingual needs, as well as to help them meet their goals, whether it's um, fast on their own time, higher quality, uh, workflow automation, et cetera, while the whole time being compliant. My area of focus is around the capital market activities, investment banks, investment funds, and legal services. Very happy to be here today, and I look forward to a great session with all of you. Great. Thanks, Christy. And now heading to North America, our next panelist is Anna. Over to you, Anna. Great. Thanks, David. Hello, everyone. Ciao and benvenuti a tutti. Uh, I'm Anna Gargiulo. I'm based in uh, our New York City office, and uh, I have over 20 years of experience in uh, the multilingual communications field. Uh, together with my team in the U.S., Canada, and Europe, uh, we focus on supporting and addressing our customers' multilingual, multicultural, and accessibility needs across finance, legal, healthcare, and life science uh, sectors. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Anna. And then back to the UK. Last but not least is Tim. Thanks, David. Uh, good afternoon. Trin Hanra. Oh, um, my name is Tim Woodhouse, um, based here in the UK, as David says. I've got 25 years of experience of working within regulated content in the language industry. My, uh, I've been very fortunate to have an international career. It's given me exposure to working in London, Paris, Luxembourg, Hong Kong, um, covering the finance sector, both in terms of capital markets and investment funds within the, uh, as well as the legal sector. I currently lead the commercial business here in uh, EMEA, covering those sectors. That's great. Thank you, Tim. So, I think you can see that collectively we have over 100 years of industry experience, which is a terrifying thought for us, but hopefully 
uh, good for you. You can benefit from some of that knowledge today, I hope. Uh, you can also appreciate that we're coming to you today from all over the world and with a background in multiple languages too. And well done especially to anyone who caught what Tim said in Welsh earlier. The great thing is that we're truly global and that's a really critical component of what makes SDL the company that it is. So let me just briefly introduce our session today. I think everyone would agree that we've been challenged by many things in business recently, not least of all in simply running our companies uninterrupted. But today is specifically about how we stay connected with our customers. And given the disruption that has taken place in everyone's lives this year, I think staying connected has become harder than ever. This session is going to cover a number of themes which impact how you stay connected, how you protect your reputation, and how you can maintain trust with your customers. And we aim to give you some really great perspectives on how to manage this delicate balancing act. So our first theme is on the subject of business continuity. And I'm going to come first to Christoph um, to talk about uh, some of the issues around the recent pandemic. Christoph, the COVID crisis has raised issues about how companies can prepare for the unexpected. What tips might you have for planning for the uh, unforeseen? Thank you, David. I'm trying to go a bit more clear in detail in taking our experience as SDL here as well and, and, and giving it a little bit of color of what's happening in the market of what we heard. So um, in a way, we were already, um, as we faced in the past, some challenges already like the hurricane Sandy um, in the U.S., strikes in France, riots in Hong Kong, and much, much more. So we had already, um, you know, the exposure in terms of disaster recovery and how to react at the local level. So this one was more global. But some of the experience that we had were put together actually to react quickly. So our customer service team are connected around the globe 24 uh, seven, we have an agile infrastructure as well as a defined process. I will say, however, what is the most important was communication. And I will say external communication as well as internal communication with our employees. So number one was really to give confidence and reinsurance to our customer. So during the pandemic, we continue to file documents that we had. We had few IPOs running in the APAC region. We had a couple of filings as well, and truly we put our customer at the heart of what we were doing and making the necessary adjustments. So I will say just kind of proactivity, responsiveness is key during this time of crisis. We created a crisis management team as well, so we were able to adjust with a couple of different um, skill sets inside this, inside this team. So we had already a foundation of what we had before and previous experience. So. Lastly, I will say the agility, flexibility, and security of kind of the setup that we put together was key. As an example, um, we saw that most of the requests from our customer during the pandemic was coming outside of what you qualified as usual um, business hours. So after 7, 8 p.m., I think, you know, kind of a lot of our customers were going back to work after the day of their family time uh, was a bit expanding during the lunch time. So we kind of adjusted with shift as well to be able to, re to react to the demand and to the high level of demand outside of business hours. So this is one um, showing really the agility and the customer first approach that we had. Then I, I heard some story about some other companies that were not able to kind of log in or everyone was not able to log in at the same time inside the IT infrastructure was not the case here. Clearly, we are all connected. We have a strong um, IT platform and infrastructure that we're able to capitalize on and everyone was able to log in at the same time. And I, I will say as well, some of the results of, of this strong plan that we put together, how we react quickly, we were also able to innovate in the, in the same time. That's great, Christoph. You covered a lot of areas there. Christy, you experienced some of these issues in Asia before the rest of us, didn't you? Do, do those points that Christoph made resonate with you as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, it's a very unfortunate event that is affecting all of us, but it's good to know that also country by country, uh, we are also on our way to recovery, so it's encouraging to see that. Uh, but it's true. Hong Kong, together with China, were the first two places uh, got hit. 
Um, but in a way, we have been equipped to deal with this type of unexpected situations and, and able to react quickly. Um, it's partly because of our physical location on the planet. So for those of you who are familiar with Hong Kong, like Tim here, um, you would know that the weather here is almost tropical. And we have this thing called uh, a typhoon day. When the typhoon hits, we need to stop whatever that we're doing and pack up and evacuate the office very quickly. But at the same time, we also know that with the type of work that we do for our clients, uh, we can, the service cannot be interrupted, not for, even just for an hour, because the work that we do for them are, have very strict filing deadlines. Like Christoph mentioned, a lot of the work that we do are around the IPOs, the M&As, the 4K, 10K filings, and the reports, court exhibits, and et cetera. So the filing deadlines will not move because there's a typhoon. Um, so therefore, everything in Hong Kong and also in, in the region here, from our platform to the, in, to the IT infrastructure to the equipment, workflow, et cetera, are all designed to ensure that the business is as usual, um, even during the unexpected. So when COVID-19 hit, um, the most frequently asked questions from our customers were around the responsiveness and, and also data security. Um, we assure our, cli our clients that with the 25 years of experience in, in the compliance world, uh, we have the measures in place. The equipment's encrypted. We must lock into, for example, um, the secure VPN to access information just the same way like an investment bank or a law firm. Uh, we have to follow the sun model that would allow work to be continued in, at any time and anywhere. Um, and, and for some of the critical roles that must stay in the office, um, we can also leverage our other APEC presence in other financial hubs like Singapore, Tokyo, Seoul, and Taiwan, and et cetera. Um, and, and then our U.S. And, and Europe colleagues are definitely pulling their way to help as well. So, again, we've been doing this for quite some time. Um, so it was very uh, reassuring to our clients that they would not see a difference uh, and we can carry on. That's great, Christy. Thank you. Very comprehensive. Tim, I wonder if I could turn to you now and perhaps ask what the companies that we work with can do to become more agile in scenarios such as those we've seen in the last few months? Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, David. I think there's probably three categories I would put this into. Firstly, I would say looking at companies becoming digital first. Um, the ongoing transformation, which was, was in play before COVID, but I think has certainly accelerated during the COVID outbreak, and then really around process efficiency. So in terms of digitalization, it's clear that companies who prioritize digitalization and pro process automation um, prior to the outbreak, a, a much better place than what we consider being uh, maybe digitally behind companies, uh, knowing that during COVID the gap, the gap is clearly growing even bigger. Um, if you have a bank who is asking you to go physically go in to show a passport or utility bill, um, clearly it's not going to be selling it to too many new customers at the moment. Uh, and those who don't have got a massive advantage. But if you look at things like digital services, um, whether it's digital bank, uh, applications, online shopping, I think historically it's been more targeted towards a more younger demographic. And this is what I think has changed significantly, um, what was happening before COVID, but certainly during COVID has, has increased the velocity. And, and one of the bigger changes that we're seeing is around digital experience. So that the, the, getting lots of new generations becoming more immersed in the digital environment. And they'll stay there. Uh, digital companies that are going to be successful are those who are going to be um, agile and can quickly cater for their offering towards different demographics. And this really comes back to just understanding the customer uh, and building a customer experience which is unique for a certain, a certain group rather than it just be a, a one-size-fits-all approach to, to, to business. Then we want to transformation. It's really a lot around how quickly transformation can happen. Again, I don't want to pick on retail banking, but the retail banking has been under threat from um, the rise and agility of challenger banks for, for quite a long time. Uh, similarly, the legal sector has been under significant transformation, and there is much disruption to what were um, traditional, what are traditional law firms uh, that we've seen in, in the past. 
Technology, and, and more specifically cloud technology, is now becoming a critical part towards the security around the content supply chain. And we're seeing significant focus through, obviously, the rise of, things, rise of things like AI within processes, be it through e-surveillance, uh, e-learning or e-discovery, and the connected workflows around those processes are clearly the way to drive uh, transformation efficiency. So in the legal space, having connectivity, e-discovery platforms such as relativity um, through AI is clearly a differentiator through, through, through transformation. So I think now more than ever, people are looking at not just provider, but trusted partners to help them navigate the continuous change that they're seeing in their business, not in our business, but their business, and how we can help them navigate that. Then to the third point around cost control and process efficiency, which is natural in the current environment that everyone's looking at this. So this doesn't mean simply looking at renegotiating the base cost line with, with the service providers. I mean, clearly that is happening. But I think we are seeing more successful companies really looking at understanding content usage and, and maximizing the content reusage because that's where they're seeing the bigger ROI. That's great, Tim, some really good suggestions there. Anna, I'm going to come to you now and just ask how perhaps some of the suggestions that Tim mentioned there can translate into customer engagement and perhaps particularly how can we protect mm. customer relationships in times of crisis like we've seen recently? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, David. And a lot of what Tim uh, has mentioned very much resonates. I think uh, two areas that, um, that have definitely made a an impression and impact in, with our clients has been around responsiveness and transparency. So it's been key for us at SDL to engage with our customers proactively uh, and timely and share with them our BCP plans. Um, but it's one thing to, to share a plan and then to actually see that plan in action. Um, as Christy and Christoph mentioned earlier, uh, we have been through challenging times before. Um, in New York City, for example, uh, we, we had Superstorm Sandy a few years ago. Um, and then, then uh, we were ready, uh, thanks to our global footprint, our infrastructure that uh, allows us and equips us uh, to easily work remotely. And then I think our transparency with our clients about our plans, communicating internally and externally our actions, uh, our reactions has promoted greater trust, uh, confidence, and uh, a closer collaboration. Thanks, David. That's great. Thank you, Anna. Uh, how about you, Christy? Any of those resonate with you? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I think Anna covered uh, the most important aspects, which are responsiveness and transparency. Uh, these are really key for our customers. Um, I think it's also the consistency in our approach and the level of commitment that we deliver to our clients throughout the whole time as well. Um, and that is really from everyone, from the account managers to the operation platform to the translators, the technical support, um, and et cetera, um, that really stays with the customers. Um, so it allows them to, to focus on working on their own BCP and knowing that the multilingual needs are being taken care of, so it's one less risk area to worry about. That's great. Thank you very much. Thanks all of you. I think we've covered the area of business continuity quite comprehensively there. This is a good opportunity perhaps to gauge the views of our watching audience on the issue that has affected us all of this year. So let's have our first poll of the day. Uh, our first question is as follows. With regard to business continuity, what has been the most challenging element of the recent pandemic crisis and the possible responses uh, on, on your screen now, they are staying engaged with customers, maintaining customer service levels, enabling employees to be productive, preserving security standards with a remote workforce, working with struggling suppliers, and finally the last one, simply remembering what day it is. So if you uh, will give us a few moments of your time to answer those questions. If you have completed that poll, and while we wait for the responses to be collected, don't forget to use the widgets at the bottom of your screen to interact with us. We really do want to hear from you. So do ask a question, and we'll come to those towards the end of our session today. 
You can also find links there to our industry web pages for financial services and legal, as well as LinkedIn showcase pages for each of the sectors where we work. You can stay up to date there with our latest news for your industry. The presentation slides from today's session are also available there as well. So let's look at the results. So quite uh, an even spread, but one <laughs> one in particular springs out, simply remembering what day it is. I think I can take that question. Uh, it's Thursday. Um, I can help you out with that. That's not too tricky a question. But I think I might just pick perhaps on one of those other peak areas, maintaining customer service levels. Um, let me perhaps ask you, Christy, about that. Were you surprised to see that one on there? Hmm, that is a very interesting one. Um, no, in, in a way, no. I can see why this is, the, um, the, you know, one of the top choices. Um, thinking about, what, you know, what we have done in the, when it first uh, happened, we had this project coming from a um, Japan client. It's a pharmaceutical company trying to get uh, something, uh, filing done. Um, so... Um, the project actually started from the beginning of last year uh, and went into to this year. Um, so when COVID-19 hit, obviously the conversation with the customer was, are we, get, oh, are we going to be able to meet that line? Um, it, it wasn't easy. It's a collective team effort, I would have to say. So what we did was really, first we, we collect client feedback and to understand the expectation uh, before COVID and, and you know after it happened. And then based on the client feedback, we trained the PMO team, we trained the, the entire platform, we negotiated, we compromised, and we set new sets of uh, KPIs um, among the team and then also provided the alternative to the customers. And then we monitor. Um, so at the end, what we did was really what Anna mentioned, uh, stay responsiveness, over communicate with our customers and, and stay very transparent. So no, so the answer is uh, in a way I'm not surprised Mm. Okay, all. Christy, thank you. And for anyone that answered the question about what day it is, I can assure you that SDL is able to provide the answer to that in over 180 languages. <laughs> so if you need to know that, then please ask. <laughs> well, I'm going to move on now um, to our next section. And uh, I think everyone probably on the call would be pleased to know that we're not going to talk about the pandemic in the next section, something we've all heard a lot about recently. But we are going to move on to a, a, a critical theme and one I think uh, that under normal circumstances would be a priority issue for many of you watching today. So it's the uh, question of security. And I'd like to come to you first, please, Christy. What content security risk do you see most frequently when providing services to financial institutions and legal firms? Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I would have to say it's something that has been mentioned a few times already by everyone. Um, and that is uh, the security and the control of data. Um, and, and this is also mentioned by our customers whenever we speak with them uh, to understand what the biggest concern is. Everything from how's my data transferred, who's working on my, on my documents, who are these translators, how are they working, what the, what the environment is like, and et cetera. So from a people's perspective, we have a very strict vetting process in place to recruit our own in-house translators in SDL, as well as to um, the same standard uh, for the external contracted linguists. Um, we have a resource management team based in EMEA, in the US, and also in APAC. And their daily responsibility is really to recruit, to test, to background check, and to accredit the qualified translators. Only a few, and I think the, the data is um, only about 14% uh, of the people that we test and, and um, background check and accredit would pass and will be onboarded to work on our content. Um, once they're onboarded, there's also continuous uh, monitoring. Um, there are strict confidentiality policies in place and code of conduct in place for, to, to guide them through the entire production process to ensure our clients' uh, data stays undisclosed. Um, so then from a control perspective, um, we have various type of technology solutions to uh, allow our client, uh, clients to do different things. Uh, for example, we have secure and centralized platform for content to be transferred and therefore eliminating the email workflow. 
um, we have uh, solutions that we can allow our clients to have the ability to pre-program workflow to be automated or to be done by human or a mix based on the content type. Um, then to the translators, in terms of you know how they how, how they work and what kind of environment um, they work in, it's mandatory for them to lock into the same secure and central platform to provide translation. So no one will be able to download or save any files to a computer. Very much in the in same way um, how a virtual data room would work. For those of you who are working on a lot of M&As, um, you would know. Um, then finally, it's really it's providing a client an audit trail as well. So then not only do they have total control on their data, um, they also will be able to have visibility on cost because they know who is doing what, um, and as well as uh, different type of solutions that provide various type of connectivity to other applications for them uh, if they see other areas for, for automation or, or greater efficiency. So I would say security That's and great. control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Some good insights there. Thank you. Uh, Christoph, coming to you, how can some of those issues be de risked, do you think, to protect the reputation of an organization? Yeah, thank you, David. Um, I will say, like, you know, looking in the past, reputation is hard to build and it's hard to maintain. It's also very critical um, in our regulated industry businesses, whatever, you know, kind of clients you touch, reputation matter. Um, I will say that, you know, to migrate the kind of reputation here, or to what to do to make sure that, you know, I kind of limit the risk is really around the technology and the security uh, throughout the entire stage of the process. So you need a strong infrastructure. We mentioned before responsiveness as well, anticipation uh, backed up by a very strong tech, um, as well adjusting the workflow. I will say that not being afraid to kind of change, um, going towards some change management and adding a couple of different tools that can complement, um, you know, what you are currently or we are currently doing. Um, we are using a lot of, and it's powered. We are using a lot in terms of improvement our AI linguistic technology as well. So this is. And, a, and an example, but you can use kind of different tools. We also have many industry security certifications um, and strong processes. So contingency plan as well. So we have different plan A, B, C, and is coming potentially back from my project management time when I was kind of handling IPOs where nothing was going according plan anyway. So we just needed to have different plan. So, and, and during the process, Again, I'm going back to the communication. Communication is key, and communication as well, as a result, it's also based on relationship. Um, and, you know, we can have all kind of the backup from the technology standpoint, but I will say that relationship matter, and it's also very important. Yes, absolutely. That communication and relationship side of things is a recurring theme, isn't it? And I'm, I'm going to come to you now. Do some of those points that Christoph raised resonate with you too? Yeah, absolutely, David. I think all of them, truly, everything we're saying uh, resonates. Security, I think, for us um, is the, the one element here that, that we circle back around. Uh, it's always been a focal point for our financial clients, our legal clients, and it's truly in our DNA uh, at SDL and our entire processes from recruiting internal, external team members to our entire IT infrastructure, um, has been built with these kinds of uh, requirements in mind. Um, I think also our, our clients faced with their own uh, newly distributed workforce, uh, they want to know that their supply chain understands this core requirement and can support them in safeguarding their confidential data. Um, so I think that truly looking at security, secure workflows, um, you know, we've been able to also help customers that um, had security on their mind uh, as a, a project to be looked at down the road suddenly became very uh, essential and we've been uh, luckily uh, able to help um, implement um, immediate uh, security requirements for them. That's great. I, actually, I'd like to stay with you, Anna, and perhaps build on something that you mentioned earlier around protecting customer relationships in times of crisis. Uh, just thinking from the perspective of the security angle, what can organizations do to optimize trust among their customers as well? 
Yeah, you know, again, uh, data protection protection is a primary concern, of course. Um, you know, with our customers, uh, we consult and often speak with them about the content journey uh, and audit trails. And I think uh, Christy mentioned that as well. Uh, the question is, who has access to documents, uh, to files, and uh, even bits of content? And having access to visibility and to the usage of that content is really key and crucial for them. So we start with simple recommendations uh, to begin with around content auditing. For example, uh, we recommend starting with um, locking down access to free online tools. Uh, these tools can expose and compromise sensitive data, which then can lead to misuse and potentially cause uh, reputation damage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tim, perhaps I could just ask you if you've got anything to add to that. Um, I really feel most of it's been covered quite well, David, but I, I just really uh, reinforce on how the, the auditing around the content supply chain is, is now key. We see a lot of um, information security reviews on, and testing around the platforms to make sure that we can, we can comply. You know, historically, the model has been agencies, as Anna and Chrissy have mentioned, of working and engaging with the freelance community. Uh, but it's clearly becoming business critical, um, as Anna says, to lock down the content supply chain and, and to provide full transparency on the reporting of who's reviewing, manipulating data at any point. And, and, and we're seeing now that that requirement is there because sometimes a regular regulator can be asking for that level of detail. So it, it's absolutely key that when you can provide that auditability, you can be able to report on it as well. Yeah, that's great. I think we're seeing, aren't we, from some of your answers that really security, auditability, reporting and visibility, they're table stakes, aren't they? Um, and it's, uh, it's the benchmark by which supplies in our area, I think, are, are really starting to be measured. So um, I'd like to use that as an opportunity to um, open those, uh, open up our second poll uh, for the audience, please. And we're going to talk about the area of security that our panelists have touched on um, and that we've started discussing uh, in the last section. So the question to your listening is, what more could your organization do to build and maintain trust around the security of customer data? So the answers you can see on your screen are as follows. Improve control over internal access to customer data. Better secure the sharing of personal data with third parties. Communicate better the steps you take to protect customer data. Restrict access to free translation tools to stop data leaving the organization. Uh, there's another option, which is all of the above. And then a final one, which is nothing more. We feel that we're doing enough already. So while you uh, take a few moments to answer that question, just a reminder that we'll be taking questions from the audience shortly. So make this your last chance to get those in, please. We really want to hear from you. And uh, all you need to do is use the Q&A module to submit those questions to us. So please go ahead and do that before you forget. Also remember that the slides from this session are in the resource section in the widgets bar. There are also some useful links there to online resources outlining our work in the finance and legal sectors, as I mentioned earlier. So hopefully some results are in. I'll move on to the next slide and uh, talk through some of those. So uh, some, it's a kind of neck and neck. Um, all of the above and a number of organizations feeling confident that they are already doing enough, which is actually very good to see and encouraging from our perspective. But perhaps um, for those um, respondents, Christoph, um, that said all of the above to that, I wonder if you might have a few comments um, on that. Was that what you expected? Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, you know, we, we kind of talk about, you know, some of the some of these processes all the time, right, when you are speaking with clients or internally as well, and you can see it outside as well, um, you know, in, in the marketplace. Um, clearly, it's not, it's not surprising. Um, this is really what kind of was expected, especially when you touch um, a subject as, deaf, as, as security, and like we say, security equal reputation in any kind of organization. So I think I'm not really surprised to see that kind of that all the above here um, kind of matter as well. But it's kind of a sum okay. of, of different action, I would say, here. Mm, absolutely, and I think it's a measure of uh, uh, the need to remain uh, 
agile and alert to the threats because they're constantly developing, aren't they? And, uh, and it's important not yeah. to be complacent in this area. Thank you, Christoph. So we're going to move on to our final theme now, which is about uh, what actually is a very broad challenge, um, the subject of regulatory compliance and how perhaps compliance can both help and hinder an organization's ability to stay connected uh, with customers. So, Tim, I'm going to come to you first. I know this is an area that you work on uh, pretty much every day. Um, what challenges do you most often encounter with customers when working on regulatory compliance initiatives? Yes, thanks, Kevin. It's such a obviously a broad subject. We could we could have a webinar for hours on this topic alone. But I think very high level, um, in all of our worlds, content is exploding. We see that in everyday uh, parts of our life. When it comes to the enterprises, the customers that we have from from a governance side, really people have to recruit armies of people to consume and translate. What it seems is a tsunami of content coming from, from regulators at the moment. Uh, both government and regulatory demands really are pushing a lot of requirements into multiple sectors. I mean, to pull out a few life sciences for sure, banking, manufacturing, energy, but realistically, you could, you could put many sectors into to, to those categories. Um, an example could be uh, failing to deliver uh, accurate or on-time filings for regula regulators um, for financial institutions can incur fines. Or if you're a, a life science company, you're missing an approval window for a new product launch, that can give you a significant loss of revenue opportunities. But I think overarching, it's been talked about many times on the call today about reputational damage. And, and really, that is a key to everything. It can be that financial cost, but the reputational cost as well is, is overarching. One of the main topics we're certainly seeing um, develop, and it's not new, but I certainly see it much more in the news on a, on a daily basis, is around environmental, social governance, or ESG requirements uh, in the international markets. It's becoming a key focus, uh, and failure could um, influence financial performance in the future. Uh, and again, a significant impact opportunity um, for the brand and its reputation at the same time. So I think really overall so having a, a trusted partner around multiple legal re regulatory projects is the key to ensuring could be a successful registration, testing, legal disclosure, whichever you want to you think about. But really the delays can cause significant loss of, of both revenue, competitiveness, and again, going back to reputation. Mm, absolutely, Tim. I'm glad you mentioned ESG as well. I think... I see that as the sleeping giant, uh, if you like, of the regulatory arena. And um, certainly it's taken a backseat recently to the pandemic, of course, but um, we've certainly witnessed over the last 12 to 18 months a, a big increase in projects around sustainability and, and ESG reporting. And that looks set very much to grow uh, quite rapidly. And just coming to you, Christy, do you see similar issues in the APAC region as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And um, I, I agree with Tim. And, and actually, I also uh, very in agreement with your comment on the ESG as well. Um, it's happening in APAC. Um, just to add on what Tim mentioned, uh, I think our customers are also looking for a provider who has the cross subject matter expertise. Um, as we see a lot of M&A activities in the life sciences space, uh, so for example, we have farmers merging in APEC in Korea, in China, in Japan, or between Japan and Korea. We have CROs merging across continents. Then we have um, the biotech companies going public in, in China, uh, investigation cases between financial institutions and et cetera. Um, what is really important for our customer is also the 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 cross disciplinary expertise. So someone who have a compliance background, but also specialize in very highly technical content. Yeah, absolutely. And actually raises a, a point around agility, which I think is one of your pet subjects, Christoph, something you're very passionate about. How can customers increase speed to market in heavily regulated industries like the finance and legal sector, do you think? Thank you, David. And yes, I do have many passion, and this one is one of them. So, I mean, every year we do a, a survey to our customer in terms of really what are the criteria that matter for you. And every time, every year for the last 10 years, time to market is one. Then you've got the kind of the quality, the security, and then the cost 
um, as well. But I will say that there is different way to kind of, you know, improve the time to market. First, I, I will say in terms of the content explosion that he mentioned and that the team mentioned, I will say that we need to kind of walk upstream and anticipate. Sometimes it's better to walk on stream, upstream and I mean, some clients may feel that you are kind of losing a little bit of time at the beginning. However, I believe that then you kind of gain this time along the process. So when you kind of package a solution about we create, manage, and distribute um, the content, clearly the upstream work is very important. Like I said before, having potentially some contingency plan, looking at you know anticipation about what can work, having different uh, discussion if some things go wrong. And producing as well, I will say, very important to introduce automation wherever it's possible. Each client has a specialized and different workflow. So I will say that this is also need to depend based on, on, on the customer, based on the requirement as well as at global, local level uh, requirements. And another one will be streamlining the process to better scale, which is key as well going with also reducing the number of moving parts um, by working also with a smaller uh, trusted partners. We can see in our industry that sometimes you have kind of the multi-vendor environment, but there is multiple vendors. We saw, for example, during this time where time to market was critical with accuracy as well, with a lot of high speed requests, we saw that you know, a lot of requests coming our way. So kind of the centralization through a robust and trusted partner. So I would say that these really are the key um, elements here, David. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Christoph. Anna, can I ask you to expand on that a little bit um, and maybe talk through what customers can do to drive efficiencies and perhaps also cost reductions in their compliance activities? Sure. Um, I think the, the one area that resonates uh, is uh, uh, upstream optimization. Uh, this is truly the holy grail. Um, I think having a clear content uh, strategy from inception through localization, publishing, distribution is what's going to drive uh, the most efficiency. Um, but I think it's also important to understand and recognize that where customers are along this uh, content journey. Um, so it's not always possible to have upstream um, strategies in place. And uh, I think at SDL, we, well, well, what we do or what we try to do is focus on knowing where our customers are on their content journey and uh, help bring optimization through AI, machine translation, uh, workflow automation, as well as subject matter expertise and um, place it where it best makes sense for them and for our customers and has uh, the biggest uh, impact. I think you uh, summarized things really nicely there, Anna. Thank you very much. That actually brings us to the end of the three themes that we were going to talk through. Um, and I'd like you uh, to start thinking about some of the questions that have come in from our audience, please. Um, we've covered a lot of ground and hopefully given everyone watching a flavor of perhaps both the challenges in staying connected with customers and a few pointers as to how we can assist in solving those issues. But now let's move to open that discussion up to all of you. And I know a number of questions have already come in on some of the points that have been made by our panelists. So I'm going to just go through some of those now. So first one here, um, Anna, I'm going to direct at you, please. Um, and actually, Christoph, you might like to think about this as well, because we might have something to add. Anna, um, the question is, you've talked a lot about the finance and legal sectors. But are there applications for the areas you have covered in other industries too? Oh, absolutely, uh, and definitely. Uh, certainly in life sciences, uh, our customers face the same challenges as our finance and legal clients. Uh, again, the need for security, uh, think about patient data, protecting that data, uh, optimizing workflows, a focus on quality, accuracy, subject matter expertise, time market, those are all applicable. Uh, to um, life sciences clients, for example. Um, as an example, uh, also is innovation. Uh, as a silver partner to Viva, uh, SDL, we are here at SDL are working closely uh, with them and their customers to provide integrations uh, with the Viva RIM solutions to plug directly into our TMS, and this minimizes repetitive tasks, 
reduce and uh, reduce is, uh, security risks. Yeah, thanks, Anna. And Christoph, you've worked in lots of industries over your career. Anything to add to that at all? Yeah, I, w I will say that, you know, we, we kind of apply this to ourselves, right? We were born um, more than 20 years ago in, in the ITO business, um, where all the transactions were kind of flourishing here in Europe with many big names, um, including nationalization and, and privatization as well. So I think it's all about, you know, I mentioned it before, I think it's speed. Um, then you have the accuracy, quality, security. I will say now it's really relevant for any kind of industry. Innovation, I mean, we are going through digital transformation, right and left, there is kind of pocket of emerging um, new technology, new demand from our customer as well, so innovation is key. I would say like just for an example, just to put that in perspective with, with what we do, right? I mean, we at, at SDL, I mean, we kind of put the SDL machine translation, um, we, we make an agreement or partnership with Ryan Court. So it's really to ensure that the legal teams around the world will benefit from the latest advance um, in secure machine translation. So this is an example. Yes, it's for legal, but it can be applicable for any kind of other user case. We have also, um, and let's go back to some of you know the, the strength that we have is that the human translation with our own in-house. Um, resources or linguists, so which means that the entire workload is, is secure. And then one, one point that I didn't touch in terms of our global um, platform as well is that we can be uh, like some of our clients, centralized or decentralized, which means that if we need to be rich in, in Asia, um, we can be rich in Asia. We don't have to wait like anyone who, to be in, uh, you know, in Europe to handle Asia or vice versa, so we can be centralized decentralized and pretty much being very close from our customer. So I will say again, back to relationship, this matter, being close from your customer. And I will say that this is kind of the basic or the foundation for any type of industry as well. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I'm glad you mentioned Rain and Court as well, because that's hot off the press. I think we only announced that last week. Um, I've got one here for you. Uh, sorry, actually, you, you again, Anna, I think. Uh, it's on the subject. Uh, I know that you have a great interest in that of accessibility. And the question is, ah. can you tell us more about your capabilities in the area of accessibility and how that might expand in the future? Sure, and uh, definitely something I'm passionate about. Um, I think from our perspective and, you know, providing content in different languages, so translation is part of the Accessibility Act. And uh, as we see a growing demand for language accessibility as well as other solutions. Um, so here at SPL, historically we've had, uh, we've been focusing on our healthcare clients and uh, our solutions are comprehensive. They span from translation to consultation to 508 remediation, braille, uh, large print and others. Uh, but in the last couple of years, I would say we have seen a continued and growing interest from our financial and corporate clients um, to increase uh, accessibility uh, across all languages uh, in all uh, accessible formats across all abilities. So it's definitely an area that uh, we're focusing, focusing on and that we will continue to uh, expand upon. Yes, and I think it's fair to say that North America is very much led in this area, um, but we expect to see a lot more on this subject in the EMEA and APAC regions as well over the next few years. So a good one to keep an eye on, I think. Uh, just a reminder to everyone listening that there's still a few minutes left for you to get in any questions that you might have, so don't be shy. Uh, please put those into the Q&A pod uh, in your uh, webinar window. I'm going to move on to, I think, hopefully a fairly straightforward question for you, Tim. Question is, can you be more specific about the sort of content formats and languages you can handle? Well, thanks, David. I like straightforward questions, so you pick the right <laughs> guy. Um, I don't really think there's any limitations around language provision or human language provision, at least. I think the only caveat there would be if, um, say, certain language pairs for neural machine translation the maturity maybe of um, the speech to text element. So I don't think the language provision piece would be really the, the challenge. I'd say the change we might see around file formats and processor file formats 
I think we talked earlier about uh, you know anybody that has an API first approach is, is key. Um, so we see an automated flow of content, uh, and we're seeing an increased requirement of language content to be delivered in formats XML, XBRL. Um, sometimes around e-learning, you might be seeing HTML5, for example. Uh, we talked about relativity discovery. Things like JSON files might come into play. So I think the file formats. Um, we can and we do manage both file formats. I think it really depends on the process. I think one other thing that comes to mind is I think we're all suffering during lockdown from webinar fatigue. So thank you everyone for being so patient on our webinar and joining today. So I think snackable content, uh, we see a lot of it on LinkedIn, easy reads, um, and particularly on video content is clearly a winner. I think we're all, you know, sometimes struggling with attention span. So I think having snackable video content is, is, is definitely a way forward. Looking at what some of the customers are doing in lockdown, I think there's particular peaks around e-learning content. Maybe some clients during the downtime are taking time to educate their employees. Uh, and also we've touched on some of the surveillance. Naturally from a home working environment, there's an increased focus on security. So I think we, we're definitely seeing an increase, increase uh, around requirements for content surveillance whilst people are working remotely. Yeah, that's been an interesting feature, hasn't it, of the lockdown, Tim, in terms of some of those sort of tactical changes that have all of a sudden peaked uh, in terms of the nature of our own business, isn't it? And, and um, it, perhaps I can say, uh, actually, I'm going to move this one to Christy. Uh, we're staying on that subject of business continuity, moving back to the first of our themes this afternoon. Um, and the question is, on the subject of business continuity, what is the view of the panel on regulators' response to the crisis? So, Christy, can I get a few words from you on that, please? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. David. Of course. I, I know you just want to make sure that I'm uh, awake at uh, 11 to 4 p.m. <laughs> it's on, so, it's yeah. late where you are, Christy. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Pressure. Uh, absolutely. Um, so, I'll share a couple of observations here. I'll start with Korea. Um, so, as you, we can see during the whole... Uh, pandemic, the, this, the, the COVID-19 um, period, uh, Korea was really leading the way in terms of the testing, how they deal with the, the how they control um, the virus from spreading, and et cetera. And I think they got a lot of praise um, from that. And um, the Korean government is actually working very closely with the regulators. Um, so, for example, they allotted, the government allotted $2 billion uh, to help some of the small to mid-sized biotech and also uh, pharmaceutical companies to develop um, COVID-19 related drugs um, as well as to help them take their products abroad to, to Europe, uh, to the U.S. and also South America. Um, so it's nice to see that. Um, also very similarly, we see the Chinese government are working very closely with the regulators too, um, trying to boost the capital market activities. Um, so last month, um, the government announced that they are going to take 1,000 technology companies um, to, again, the government will guide them and will fund them um, throughout the, the fundraising process to help them uh, get listed on the Shanghai Stock Exchange. Um, so what we see here from this side of the world is that the regulators are working very closely with the government. Uh, it's nice to see that collaboration, isn't it? Not always comfortable partners, I think, Christy, but uh, it's been one of the features, I think, isn't it, recently, to see that kind of uh, collaboration, collaboration taking place and, uh, and very encouraging too. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we're nearly at the top of the hour, so we've more or less run out of time for more questions, I'm afraid. So um, for anyone that uh, posed questions and hasn't had them answered, we will take those unanswered questions and come back to the individuals on those. Um, I'm sure you'll all appreciate having listened to us so patiently uh, today that staying connected is more critical than ever. And I hope you can see that we at SDL are 100% focused on our customers so that you can focus on, on your customers. We've joined you today from around the world to demonstrate that we were here for you before the recent crisis and we're still here to help you with your business continuity. Um, and we've also touched on those critical areas, I think, of innovation and transformation as things start to develop moving forward. So a quick reminder 
that the webinar recording will be made available to you on demand at the end of the reconnect series and, and don't forget also that there is one more session in this series so be sure to join that the details of that are on the screen at the moment and if any of the themes discussed today have left you wanting to know more then please do get in touch with us via the contact details on the slide displayed now or by connecting with any of us on social channels we'll be able to find us um, by uh, putting our names into those. It just remains for me to offer my sincere thanks to all our panellists for their great insight today. I really enjoyed that. I'd like to thank you all for taking part. Um, and with that, we'll end today's session with a final thank you to all of you for attending today as well. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.